Welcome to the Kingdom Current broadcast. I am your host, Pastor Nathan Branham. The mission of the Kingdom Current is to equip the worldwide body of Christ with a prophetic edge in the Word and a kingdom view on culture. Today's broadcast is part two in the series, Gifts of the Holy Spirit, Discovering Your Gifts. On today's podcast, we are going to briefly review a few points from part one. Then we're going to expound upon the gift of discerning of spirits. I have a powerful personal testimony of this gift operating in my life. You'll want to stick around for that. Then we will conclude today with the second category of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the power gifts. Those include the gifts of faith, healing, and miracles. So, all that and so much more on today's episode of the Kingdom Current Broadcast. Let's go. All right, welcome into part two of Gifts of the Holy Spirit, Discovering Your Gifts. I would encourage you, if you have not listened to part one of this series, please do so. We cover a lot of material, and I just don't have time to go back and look at it all again and cover it again, but I will remind you that uh, on the first broadcast, we really nailed down, I felt this was imperative, why we need the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And the the first and the primary reason we need the gifts is because we want to be obedient to the Word of God. We looked at the first chapter, and uh, this provided more of an incentive and reason for you and I to be aware of the gifts, desire the gifts, and practice them. Paul, in his introduction, said, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 7, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation or the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Any time that the body of Christ is under threat of judgment, like the United States is currently in 2022, coming to the end of 2023, And when Jesus is closer to returning, splitting the eastern sky with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, when the second advent could be at the door, as I believe that it is nearing every day, rest assured that we are closer today than we have been. We need these gifts. We need these talents. We need these additions, these equippings that the Holy Spirit wants to give us in these gifts. And that's what Paul was saying. But then we also looked at 1 Corinthians 12, and we started to exposit and explain and expand on what we see there in 1 Corinthians 12. But look at the very first verse and the very last verse of 1 Corinthians 12 as to the reason why we desperately need the gifts. First, verse 1 tells us that we need not be ignorant of the gifts. Hosea 4, 6 says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And as Christians, as believers, we can be susceptible to ruination, to destruction, to attack and lack in many areas of our life if we are walking without these gifts. That's why Paul said, I don't want you to come short in 1 Corinthians 1.7. Don't come short in any gift as you await the revelation and return of Jesus. So we're not to be ignorant, but go to the last verse in chapter 12, and it says, earnestly desire, covet earnestly is how the King James reads, When are we ever told to covet? We are only told, we are only commanded against coveting in general, but we are told to desire, earnestly desire the best gifts. And so we need the gifts to be established. We need the gifts to be confirmed according to Romans chapter one, and we need the gifts to remain obedient to the scriptures 
in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and elsewhere that we will eventually get to. But you'll recall that we divided the gifts of the Holy Spirit up for ease of instruction and memory. This is not how they're laid out in the Scripture. So, And if that bothers you to separate the gifts this way, just throw it out. It's okay. It's just one way that I've found to make these gifts more manageable and understandable in my life. The gifts are found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 4 and going down to verse 10. And we separated those gifts into three different categories, which were the revelatory gifts, which include the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, and discerning of spirits. We covered those first two. We're going to begin here momentarily with the discerning of spirits. The second group are the power gifts. Those are faith, gifts of healing and miracles. And the final gift are the vocal gifts. Those are prophecy, tongues, and interpretation. So let's begin with the discerning of spirits. The gift of the discerning of spirits is a gift in which God enables you to determine if something, whatever that is, is of God, the devil, or man. Generally speaking, every Christian should discern. That does not mean, however, that we all have this gift of discerning of spirits. And on that point, every Christian should manifest from time to time and should operate in just about every gift that we will cover, but it does not mean that they have or possess that specific gift. However, because Christians are vessels, we are pots in the potter's hand, God can manifest, as we already read at the beginning of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the Holy Spirit can manifest these gifts through whomever he wills. But the gift of the discerning of spirits, every Christian is called to discern spirits. In fact, if you have your Bible, turn to 1 John chapter 4. And if you don't have your Bible, you may want to grab it. Look what it says, 1 John chapter 4. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test or try the spirits, whether they are of God or not. Now, just stop right there. It may sound as if John is saying that we need to be able to figure out whether or not there is a spirit or ghost or demon behind every rock. And now, while that is included in the discerning of spirits, which I'll explain momentarily, you'll see that he actually has much more of a pedestrian, natural uh, uh, explanation of what this gift is. Look at how he finishes out 1 John 4. He says, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So he starts out by saying, don't believe every spirit. Well, what's he equating this spirit to? He's equating these to men and women that could be either real or false prophets. He goes on, by this you know the Spirit of God, every spirit or every prophet, teacher, pastor, whatever, that confesses that Jesus has come in the flesh is of God. There is one litmus test, one test of discernment that we can apply to anything to determine whether it is of God or not. Now, I have only heard stories and I don't have one at hand. But I have heard of the more supernatural explanation of the discerning of spirits wherein people have said a spirit, a demon, or even an angel of light, what appeared to be, quote unquote, a benevolent spirit, appeared to these people and they applied this litmus test to this spirit and it would not confess that Jesus came in the flesh and it left. That is, again, the supernatural explanation of this gift of the discerning of spirits. But he goes on. Look at verse 6 now, 1 John 4, 6. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. I think that John, as an apostle, had the ability to be more confident in who he was and whether or not someone would hear him and then state the conclusion that if someone wouldn't hear you, we know that they're wrong and I'm right. I would just say that I have enough self-doubt, and, and I don't mean this in any <laughs> braggadocious way, I have enough humility 
and and not as much self-confidence in myself to say that if someone didn't listen to me, that uh, that I was in the right and they were in the wrong. I would probably check myself first. But John said that for those that didn't listen to him, that they were operating, that you could discern or distinguish or determine that they were operating in a spirit of error. Let me continue this thought that every believer is a discerner. Hebrews chapter 5, look there really quick. Hebrews 5, look at verse 12. It says, For by this time you ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. So he's providing a metaphor and saying, By this time, you ought to be able to understand about Melchizedek. This was the context in Hebrews 5. He said, I want to tell you these deep things, but you're just like a baby. You have not been in your word. You have not been studying. Look at how he describes it in verse 13. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Every Christian is called to be a discerner, and that begins by studying the truth. Now, I've been told this again, this is hearsay. It is suggested that the best way to determine a counterfeit bill is not to study counterfeits, but to study the truth. And by knowing the intimate details of, say, a dollar bill, the real one, it is easier to spot a fake. And this is what Paul is saying in this sense, that if you know the truth, if you are studying the Word of God, if if you are meditating on the Word of God, like Psalm 1 says, you will have a certain level of discernment. You will be able to spot truth from error. But the gift of discerning of spirits is beyond this. The gift of the discerning of spirits is being able to distinguish when nobody else can what is right and what is wrong. I have Jim Gull's book, The Seer, and on page 87, actually 86 and 87, he quotes Dick Iverson, who gives a very comprehensive definition of what the gift of the discerning of spirits is. And I'll read this, and then I'm going to give you an example from Paul's life in action to show you what this actually is. So here is Dick Iverson's definition of this gift. The gift of discerning of spirits is the God-given ability or enablement to recognize the identity and very often the personality and condition of the spirits which are behind different manifestations or activities To discern means to perceive, distinguish, or differentiate. The dividing line between human and divine operation may be obscure to some believers, but one with the faculty of spiritual discernment sees a clear separation. The gift of the discerning of spirits is an additional amount of discernment that is given to the Christian operating in this gift by the Holy Spirit to figure out what is not being discerned by other Christians. We see this in Acts chapter 16 and verse 16. You're probably familiar with this story. When Paul was in Thyatira in Acts chapter 16, it says this in verse 16, Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us. That word divination is puthos or python, In the Greek, she had a spirit of Python, so obviously a demonic spirit. And it describes her as someone who brought her masters much profit by fortune-telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. Now, very instructive here. So here is a slave girl that was proclaiming something that was true. Were Paul and his entourage servants of the Most High God? That's what she said. These men are servants of the Most High God. Yes. Who proclaimed to us the way of salvation? Is that what they were doing? Yes. 
So why didn't anyone else figure this out and cast it out before? Because apparently she was saying it in such a way, she was saying it as an angel of light, and no one else could figure out maybe why she was saying it, but they just said, well, this is true, so let's allow it to continue. But pay attention to how this gift manifested in Paul's life. It said, but Paul, greatly annoyed, it bothered him in his spirit. This gift manifested when everyone else was oblivious to it, when this just flew right over everyone's head, because the Holy Spirit used Paul in the gift of discerning of spirits, he was able to call out what most, which actually, which all were saying, eh, this is okay. This just must be what she does. She loves God. But it wasn't. Paul was annoyed, and this was the gift of the discerning of spirits, but he didn't just ignore that annoyance. He rebuked it and rescued that girl. When you operate in the gift of the discerning of spirits, you may not know why something is bothering you and maybe nobody else, but it very well could be an Acts chapter 16 type situation where the Holy Spirit is cluing you in, keying you in to what the devil is doing, even though it looks like an angel of light. This is a most necessary gift and we should be praying for it. I have operated in this gift of the discerning of spirits, and of course, as I read the Word of God, I know, just like every other Christian, I have a certain level of discernment. But there have been times where it has been very strong and very clear and very accurate. Let me share one of those times. Back in 2017, we had a wonderful revival organization come to our city. It was called, they're called Time to Revive. They're still operating and ministering, I believe, out of Texas. But they came to Ohio, and they got so many churches together. And we had a city citywide evangelism blitz. We had uh, uh, joint services where we worshiped together, and it was it was glorious. Uh, we did that for about a week, and then that that group left, and they left different leadership and churches in charge of continuing this movement. So we would continue to meet, continue to go to churches, continue to go out on the weekends. Well, one church that hosted the entire event, they did a great job, but ultimately the the local pastors kind of let the ball drop, and here was this church they they had invested so much time, they were left holding the bag in some ways. Well, we had gotten together six months to a year after we had done our initial revival together, and one of the pastors of the hosting church of the entire event, great guy, love him, but we got together and we were just kind of talking about how it went and, you know, what what we should do moving forward. And he just, he had a chip on his shoulder. I really didn't think about it, but he just started running everyone down and how it was, it was horrible and bad. And in all of us, every pastor, there had to be 20 people around this, this table. We all just felt horrible. Like what's going on here? And I had no inkling. I had no desire to say anything. I didn't want to raise up. I didn't want to correct him. I had no desire. I felt like everyone else did. And as I I think back on it, everybody's heads were down. And all of a sudden, I, I, I promise you, this was God. The Spirit of God rose up on the inside of me. And I looked at him in love and I said, Brother, you're bitter. And you could have heard a pin drop. I stopped him in the midst of this rant and railing and running everybody down. He was hurt, understandably. But you've got to take that to the Lord and not let your bitterness, that acridity, that acidity destroy and defile many. And the Holy Spirit, and I say this with humility, I didn't want to do it. If I know the Spirit of God, and I believe I do, I know that day was God saying, hey, lovingly stop this brother. 
And I stopped him and I said, brother, you're bitter. I'm asking you to repent right here. Just we, we don't hold it against you. And as you could imagine, he was offended. It caused quite the uproar at the moment. They had to console him afterward. Again, I felt I felt bad, but I, I felt it more important to follow the Holy Spirit and the discerning of spirits. You say, well, was the devil using that young man? Yeah, just like the devil has used Peter and you and I at times, we all make mistakes. Thank the Lord that since then he and I have reconciled. But it was it was important because in that moment, this bitterness, this bitter root was trying to affect and influence every person there. And God enabled me to say, hey, wait, let's rethink this. No one else was going to do it. Everyone else would have let it pass. But the Holy Spirit used me to discern that spirit, to distinguish the spirit of truth from the spirit of error. That's what God wants to do in your life with the gift of discerning of spirits. One more quick definition I use for my Bible study. Of course, I use a wide array of different Bibles and different translations and versions, but I use a very simple Bible program. It's called Power Bible CD. And uh, you can, of course, now you can get it in a download, which I have. One of the resources that I really enjoy on it is Robertson's New Testament Word Pictures. And he defines this gift as a most needed gift to tell whether the gifts were really of the Holy Spirit and supernatural or merely strange, though natural or even diabolical. So here again, it fits the definition that this gift helps us determine when nobody else can, whether it's of God or whether it's not. I've shared this story before on another podcast, but I think it bears repeating here, and then we're going to move on to the power gifts. But one of my my favorite ministers that I love is uh, Bobby Connor. He has a prophetic ministry, and, and the guy just loves the Bible. You can tell every other word out of his mouth is Bible. But he said that he was visiting a church, and at their altar ministry time, he said that this pastor invited his prayer team up, and the leader of the prayer team began to pray. And I don't think he knew that that was the leader at the time. But anyway, someone started to pray. It was a woman started speaking in tongues. And Bobby discerned something very off. And Bobby asked the pastor, he said, who is that woman praying in tongues? He said, well, that's, that's the leader of our prayer team. And Bobby said, I've discerned this woman is not speaking in tongues. She's a witch. Well, and come to find out that's exactly what happened. She was operating in a false tongue, and they got her out of there. So you can see how important this gift of the discerning of spirits is. Let's pray for this. But more importantly, or maybe equally as important, Let us study the truth so that when an error or a lie or a demon comes before us, we can call it, discern it, and rebuke it. One more point on this before we move on, and that is someone has suggested that the discernment of spirits is also the ability to actually see into the spirit realm. So you could actually see demons, see angels, see what is taking place behind the natural. And I would agree with that, that if we can discern truth from error, we should be able to have spiritual sight to see whether it is God, angel, devil, or man. I have several friends that they can see into the spirit realm. I not so much but I have before. And someone has suggested that if we could see into the spirit realm, it would be too much for us to take. And I don't doubt that. One Sunday morning, I believe that I experienced the discerning of spirits in seeing into the spirit realm. It was just before service, and I was praying and prepping and reading my Bible and taking notes. And I had closed my eyes, and I saw this grotesque demonic face And I thought, well, that was unpleasant. It certainly didn't induce joy into my heart. I can tell you that. Well, later that morning, 
God showed me. He said, Nathan, you discerned a tormenting spirit. And I thought, wow, that was ugly. That was demonic. That certainly makes sense. Well, after we had worshiped by song and after we had worshiped by giving and worshiped with the word, we had some altar time and the Lord reminded me, he said, Nathan, I want you to talk about that tormenting spirit you discerned. Well, I shared that and several came up and the the one person that I believe that it was ultimately for a young girl, she said, I have been tormented with so much fear, so much fear of being lost, so much fear of hell. And and just she went on and it was amazing. We were able to rebuke that lying devil as she placed her faith in what Jesus did for her at the cross. She was a believer. She, matter of fact, very consecrated young lady. But God does this to benefit and bless all. That's why he does it. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7 says, that the manifestation is given to every man to profit. God wants to bless us. I am blown away. My mind is boggled by those who wouldn't want to embrace these gifts. What child would ever deny a gift at Christmas? I don't think any unless they had some mental issues, some emotional developmental issues. No one would deny something of value, especially a gift from heaven. And just a reminder, we're going to talk about the doctrine of cessationism probably in the next few broadcasts. But before we get there, I want to thoroughly cover the material in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14. So we need to continue. So that was the gift of discerning of spirits. Now, let's move on to the second category, the second grouping of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and those are faith in verse 9, gifts of healing also in verse 9, and then miracles in verse 10. The first gift that we'll cover in the power gifts is faith. First, let's define, generally speaking, what faith is. Faith comes from the Greek word pistis, and it means trust, persuasion, belief, or body of belief. 2 Timothy 1.12, Paul says this, For I know whom I have believed in and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed to him until that day. Paul believed and he was persuaded. That is to say, he had full trust in what God was able to do. I often jokingly say in my Bible studies and in my teaching when I have feedback and I say, well, define faith for me. And immediately people go to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1, which is not wrong, which is accurate to do, but they often quote it to me in the King James, which is a very poor translation of what faith is because it says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of of things not seen. Now, faith is not substance. The 13th century Elizabethan English word substance apparently meant the confidence, the assurance, or the persuasion of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is assurance that what God said, I am persuaded of. That is faith. So now we know Hebrews 10, 17, that says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the words of Jesus. That makes sense because I believe things that I'm told depending upon the trustworthiness and the reliability of the source of which I'm told. If God said it, we need to believe, we need to trust. That's why we continue to read the word of God because as we hear it, We believe what's said, and our faith is built. I often joke around and say, faith is like Chef Tony and the Miracle Blade system. Now, those that are familiar with my ministry, you hear me kind of joke around about this a lot, so you're probably rolling your eyes right now. But it really does make sense. If you remember Chef Tony, he was the master infomercial of the Miracle Blade knife set. And he'd get up there, and he'd slice and dice the the vegetables and the meat and the fish. And 
he would cut through a brick and cut through paper. I mean, it was just amazing. I mean, he could sell this knife set to anybody. I mean, he was masterful. You'd turn on the TV and you didn't need a knife set, but you turned it on and he would persuade you. He would convince you with many proofs that you needed this knife. What would he do? He would build your trust in him because he had knife skills. You'd you could see him chop, slice, and dice. I mean, just, brrr, I mean, he'd just chop right through it. But he would build your confidence in him as a chef, knowing what he was talking about. And then he would demonstrate everything this knife could do. And by the time you were done, you needed the miracle blade set. And you better believe I got a miracle blade. Did it do everything he said it could do? No, because half of it was just his skill and probably, well, some of it was probably camera magic, but you get the point. Faith is persuasion primarily and first in what God has said. If we didn't have natural faith, if humans didn't have natural trust, we couldn't live life. You wouldn't be able to function. You couldn't get out on the highway because you didn't trust the safety measures put in place. You wouldn't trust that the little double yellow lines are keeping that 2,000 pound piece of metal from crossing over and smashing you and killing you. You wouldn't ever go to a drive through because you would not trust if that teenager, that booger picking, zit popping teenager, would be spitting in your burger or dropping hair on your fries. <laughs> and I know now probably you're not going to ever trust a drive through person again, but you get my point. There is natural faith and there is saving faith. Paul said that every Christian and this is in Romans 12, has been dealt a measure of faith. Not all men have saving faith, but those whom Jesus has saved, called and chosen and elected, they have faith. But that faith, while every Christian has faith, they believe in their heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. And the Bible says, you are saved not every Christian operates in this gift of faith. Now, I was asked by a pastor. He said, uh, Pastor Nathan, what gift out of the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit do you think is most important to have? Well, I, I thought about it, and my mind went immediately to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Paul talks about the best gifts. He said prophecy, and prophecy being inspired speech, and we'll explain that more later. I said, well, prophecy, of course. He said, well, hold on. He said, I think the most important gift to possess is the gift of faith because that gift can make any other gift work and work to its max capacity. And as I thought about it, because every gift of the Holy Spirit, everything we do in the Christian life while we're on earth operates or fails to operate or the operation is measured based on our faith. If you have great faith, you will have great manifestation. If you have medium faith, that your work will correspond accordingly. So I agree with this. It may be important. We have to desire earnestly the best gifts. And ultimately, as we'll find out, the best gifts are those by which we can love on others like Jesus and bring the most glory to God with. And the gift of faith, if you use it for others, you will see great things take place. And we organize the gift of faith under the power gifts because faith equals power available. When we trust God, when we thoroughly rely on what he said and what he has done, there is nothing that can stand in our way. Heaven and earth may pass away. Mountains may stand. But by our words, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, we can declare, say unto this mountain, speak unto this mountain to be removed and cast into the sea. And if you believe not and not doubt in your heart, you will have whatsoever you say. The gift of faith may be one of the most foundational gifts that we could ever ask for because faith makes everything else in the gospel, in the kingdom, work. And in fact, let's 
go to the life of Jesus in Mark chapter 11 and see what the gift of faith did for Jesus. In Mark chapter 11 and verse 12, look what it says. Now the next day, when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry, and seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, Let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. Now I want you to go down because they're going to come back later and watch what happened. Verse 21, Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. So Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever shall say to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. You may respond, well, wasn't that kind of an exercise in futility? And of course, I understand no disrespect to Jesus, but absolutely not. I would respond, no, this is was a demonstration of the power of faith. And you say, how so? Well, simple. Faith is made up of two things, not one. I know I've defined faith as trust, persuasion, belief, and a body of belief or a codification of belief and ethics. But faith, true gospel faith, is comprised of this, belief and words faith and confession. Romans chapter 10 and verse 8, look what it says. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth, in your heart. That is the word of faith, which we preach. Romans 8 tells us that we believe we preach the word of faith. It's not just faith. Faith is not faith just by believing and trusting. That is the beginning But we see in verses 9 and 10 that the manifestation comes when we speak. Verse 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe, there we go, there's the mouth and the faith, the belief, you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That is salvation. But salvation is carried out and lived just as you entered. Verse 10, For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made to salvation. The gift of faith is the ability to believe God when maybe everyone else has doubted what God has said, and then to speak it with absolute confidence, and it produces the miraculous results that everyone else denied produces exactly what God has said. That, my friend, is a power gift. The gift of faith, the gift of trust that manifests in faithful words, trusting in God. That is the gift of faith. Let me provide one more example of this gift going again to Paul. In Acts 27, you recall Paul was on the verge of shipwreck as he was going to Rome. The ship encountered Eurachlodon, that destroying wind and storm, and Paul was visited by an angel. The angel had a message and increased his faith to the point that it was a gift of faith, a supernatural ability to believe when everyone else was doubting. Look at Acts 27 and verse 21. But after long abstinence from food, Paul stood in the midst of them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and have not sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss. And now I urge you, take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. Now let me ask you, do you think everyone he was talking to believed that they were going to survive? No, that's why they were fasting. They were scared out of their minds. They couldn't eat. They were so disturbed by the prospect of dying in this storm that they hadn't eaten. But here's how Paul could make this declaration that there would be no loss of life. Look at verse 23. For there stood by me this night an angel of the God to whom I belong 
and whom I serve, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar, and indeed God has granted you all those who sail with you. Therefore take heart, men, for I believe God that it will be just as it was told me. However, we must run aground on a certain island. What a beautiful gift of faith in the midst of impending doom, disaster, and loss. An angel appears and grants Paul this gift of confidence and trust, and he was able to stand up in the face of everyone's attitudes of all of their fears and say, listen, you should have listened to me, but God is gracious. And because I am his, he's going to spare you all, but we've got to run aground. We're going to lose everything, but we are going to be saved. Now, you don't think that's a gift? Well, try telling those sailors that that wasn't a gift of an assurance that God was going to protect them. Let's move on to the second power gift. We need the gift of healing in this hour. But stop, rewind the tape. I intentionally misspoke because it actually reads, if you look at verse 9 in 1 Corinthians 12, look what it says, to another faith by the same spirit, we just covered that, to another the gifts, plural, of healing. The gifts of healing. What is he saying? Well, first, let's point out the obvious. A gift or gifts of healing is the ability for someone to be healed or to pray for healing or to administer healing to those who are sick. But why the plural word gifts of healing? Here is what I think is being said, and this comes from my experience. When I had first gotten saved, radio was a major part of my growth and development, Christian radio. And I would turn it on, and sometimes I had made it a habit, actually, to get up at 4 a.m., and I would turn on. I had a favorite radio broadcast, and it was a local charismatic church. And, of course, I didn't define it in those terms in those days, but just a church that believed in healing, believed in the, in, in the operation of the Holy Spirit, And the pastor was talking about having healing meetings. I surmised from what he would share that he operated in the gift of healing. And he made what at the time to me was a puzzling statement. He said, if you have bumps, warts, cancers, or tumors, I want you to come to this meeting. And I thought that was unique because, well, if God was going to heal, you could be crippled, blind, or deaf, as well as have all those tumors and bumps and warts, whatever, and you could still get healed. Well, no. What I have come to understand is that gifts of healing, God blesses, God enables certain people. Remember these verses at the beginning of our study from 1 Corinthians, the Holy Spirit gives gifts. This is verse four. He has different administrations and different operations. This goes right in line. So in other words, there is a variety of ways and a variety of gifts, and they all look different depending on who he uses and how he uses. And healing is one of those gifts that has a myriad of different ways of applications and manifestations. The lead elder at our church, Tom, he shares a story that at the church that he went to for some of his uh, young Christian life, that they invited a guest minister in. And one of the gifts of healing that he had was the gift of sight. That if you were in a meeting and you were blind, you would end up seeing. Well, and that's exactly what happened. He relates a story that as he was sitting there, that two girls were sitting in front of him and their eyes opened and they could see. That was his gift of healing. I went to a church uh, just south of me in Botkins, Ohio, Pastor Peter Dosick, and uh, he is used in the gifts of healing. He uh, holds uh, healing meetings, healing crusades, and one of his gifts, as I understand it, is blind eyes are open and deaf ears are open. But other 
types of healing, not so much. But why does God do that? Well, those are some questions that I can't really answer. I just know that God does do it. And we see this very clearly from the life of Jesus. Let me read Acts 10.38. It says that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. One of the key aspects of Jesus' ministry was this power gift of healing. He healed just about everyone that he came in contact with. I could cite a myriad of examples, but I want to share this one with you in Mark chapter 8, because I want to encourage you by it. Mark chapter 8 and verse 22, let's observe Jesus as he operates in this gift of healing. It says, Then he came to Bethsaida, and they brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. So he took the blind man by the hand, led him out of the town, and when he spit on his eyes and put his hands on him, he asked him if he saw anything. And he looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. Then he put his hands on his eyes again and made him look up, and he was restored and saw everyone clearly. This is an amazing testimony. First off, let me just point this out. The man was not immediately healed, but Jesus had to pray for him once. And then in verse 25, it said, Then he put his hands again and made him look up. It took Jesus two times to pray or to declare healing over this blind man before he saw completely clear. Why is that important? Well, first off, if Jesus had to pray more than once for somebody, I wonder if we should have to pray more than once for somebody to be healed. Yes, even with the gift of healing, we have to pray more than once. We have to persevere in prayer. I believe it was Robbie Dawkins who made the statement. He said, if Jesus had to pray for someone twice to be healed, I probably have to pray a thousand times for each time that he prayed. And I would say a hearty amen with that. You say, even with the gift of healing? Yes, even with the gift of healing. And here is what I encourage you to do. For any of these gifts, the Holy Spirit wants to enable you to operate in them. My thought, my philosophy of the gifts and practicing them is practice as many as you can with as many opportunities as present themselves to you. As I have stated, I generally operate in the revelatory gifts and the vocal gifts, though it is part of my calling to practice and to strive after and to ask for the power gifts. I shared with you in our first part of this series that one of the ways to discover your gift is to figure out what gift you desire. I desire the revelatory gifts and I desire the vocal gifts, but interestingly enough, if I'm just being honest, I have desired the power gifts, faith, gifts of healing and miracles, the least. I don't know why. I can't explain that except to say that God has clearly manifested these other gifts in my life much more than he has these power gifts, which is just a signal and indication to me that that is how the Holy Spirit wants to manifest in my life. Though, at this point in my life and ministry, I am starting to see and feel and know how important and the need that these power gifts are because healing is such a potent witness and testimony to the reality of Jesus. For those that have done any missionary work in third world countries, you know of which I speak. India is a third world country, have many beloved brothers and sisters there. I love that country. I hope to get back next year. But one testimony continues to resurface there, and that is someone was sick in the family. The 
Hindus couldn't heal them. The witch doctors couldn't heal them. But they went to find a Christian missionary, and Jesus, the great physician, healed that individual, and that family was one to Christ. Healing evangelism is a major means of salvation in these countries. That's why I'm increasingly desiring these gifts, these power gifts, gift of faith, gift of healing, and miracles. Let me give you one example, I believe, of the gift of healing in my life. I was eating dinner with my family, and this has been more than 10 years ago now, but I got a call from one of our church members. Her name was Leah. She said, Pastor, Danny is in the hospital. Can you come pray? He's about ready to die. Well, come to find out, his diabetes went into overdrive, went into a diabetic coma. They were keeping him alive on an artificial heart pump chest compression machine in the ER. Well, I didn't know any of that. I get to the hospital. I walk into their largest emergency room. Doctors are rushing everywhere. It was pandemonium. And the doctor said, got everyone's attention and said, hey, the pastor is going to pray. Well, before I share what happened, they told me as we were going in there, they said he was actually supposed to be life flighted. We couldn't get the the uh, helicopter and he's, he's just about gone. I mean, we're about ready to unplug the machine. So we go back into the ER, and the doctor, uh, the attending physician, just so happened to be a female, said, hey, the pastor's here. We're going to pray. So <laughs> talk about being put on the spot. I was hoping to have a little prayer and trust God and walk out of there. But I took that pressure, and I transferred it to Jesus. And I said, Father, we humbly come before you today, and we are asking that you would rescue Danny's life. We declare your promise that says, by your stripes, he was healed. So, Danny, we declare you're healed in front, in the presence of all of these physicians. Jesus, you said that you're the healer. Would you work a miracle? Well, I just prayed a prayer. I didn't feel any different than I typically feel when I uh, when I pray, accept a little more pressure because you're, I'm in the middle of this intense situation, all these doctors are around. Well, I go to the waiting room, and we didn't know what to expect. We were just waiting on God. Well, the attending physician, she comes in, and she is shocked and surprised. She looks at me, looks at his wife, Leah, and she said, we have just witnessed a miracle. Wow. Danny came out of that coma lived several more years, and eventually went on to be with the Lord. But a wonderful testimony of a gift of healing. Jesus said, I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to heal you. And that is the power of the gift of healing. Father, I am praying for the one whose heart is hungry. I am praying for the Christian's heart who is dull and insensitive to your desire to fill them with gifts and to bless them with gifts. God, would you, as the Father of lights from whom every perfect gift comes, would you grant us these gifts of the Holy Spirit graciously? We touch and agree concerning these gifts that you are going to overflow us with them now in Jesus' holy name. Amen. If this ministry has been a blessing to you, would you please support us in prayer? And hey, make sure to tell your friends that there's a new powerful prophetic broadcast in town and they need to tune in. Don't forget, The Kingdom Current is a ministry of Grace Fellowship Church in Lima, Ohio. You can find out what we're doing in Lima at gfclima.com. If you're able to give and help us financially, we would be so grateful. It's really easy to do. We receive offering via PayPal. You can email your gift to kingdomcurrent94 at gmail.com. You can also give by Cash App. That's just the cash tag and the word Kingdom Current. Remember, the Kingdom Current exists to equip you with a prophetic edge in the word and a kingdom view on culture.